Hi, everybody. One last topic we want to discuss in terms of sorption uh, is the sorption of neutral organic compounds to dissolved organic matter. And I put the word dissolved in quotation marks here because organic matter typically doesn't truly dissolve in water. Um, but we define the dissolve phase as anything that passes through the filter. And that's the filter that you happen to be using. We've discussed in the past the fact that usually when you're doing water sampling in, in the real world, in real waters, you probably are going to use a 0.7 micron filter. So anything that passes through that 0.7 micron filter is being technically uh, considered to be dissolved, even though it's probably not dissolved. The true definition of things that are dissolved is that they are individual molecules floating around in water, and they will never settle out, no matter how long you wait. Uh, there's another thing that we sometimes, another term that we sometimes use, and that's the term colloids. Oops, sorry. That's the term colloids. Colloids. Um, and colloids are very small particles that never settle out of solution, no matter how long you wait. Uh, but again, it's pretty tough to figure out how long it's forever. <laughs> so you can't wait forever to see if the colloids are going to settle out. So we just define colloids also as very small particles that pass, pass through the filter, usually a 0.7 micron filter. So this dissolved organic carbon uh, can have a couple of effects. And it can increase the apparent solubility, apparent solubility of your chemical. Um, so, you know, your chemical, for example, in groundwater, you might have, you might measure a solubility, you might measure a concentration of your chemical in groundwater that's above the theoretical aqueous solubility, and that could be because you have very small, fine particles in your groundwater, and your chemical is sticking to them. So it's artificially inflating the concentration of your chemical in the dissolved phase. Um, the chemicals that are stuck to those small particles are not available to evaporate into the air from the water. And so it changes your air-water you know, distribution ratio. It's not, it's not really your equilibrium constant, because Henry's law is the equilibrium between the truly dissolved and the air. Uh, but this has to account for the fact that some of what you measure as being true dis truly dissolved is not truly dissolved. It's actually absorbed the particles. Uh, generally speaking, when we think about bioavailability, we make the assumption that chemicals that are absorbed are not bioavailable. So being absorbed to dissolved organic carbon would also decrease the bioavailability of the chemical. Um, and we also make the assumption that light doesn't really affect things that are absorbed onto particles, including dissolved organic carbon. Uh, so your compound might not be susceptible for, to photolysis if it's absorbed onto the, the DOC. And the interesting thing about DOC is that you can see an effect. You can see all of these effects, even at very low concentrations. So for co-solvents, we needed about a 5% volume fraction to see any effect. But for DOC, we can see uh, important influence of DOC even down as low as you know, 5 milligrams per liter of DOC. Um, so the value of the equilibrium constant for absorption of our chemical to the dissolved organic carbon, which is KDOC, is going to depend on the properties of the DOC. Right? In the absorption lecture, we talked about the fact that organic carbon is different depending on where you get it from. There's all different types of organic carbon in the world. Well, it's also true that there's all different types of dissolved organic carbon in the world. And so we might want to define this equilibrium constant for absorption of our chemical partitioning between the water and the DOC. Uh, it turns out this is extraordinarily difficult to measure. I mean, it was bad enough trying to measure things like Henry's Law constant. Uh, but how do you separate out the chemical that's absorbed to the DOC from the chemical that's truly dissolved when, by definition, you can't filter the DOC out of the water? So then how do you measure it? It's, it's not easy. So doing this is quite difficult. Um, and there have been some attempts to characterize dissolved organic carbon based on its overall molecular weight, its, the, its ability to absorb UV light, its degree of aromaticity, which you could measure using either carbon-13 or, or uh, proton NMR, and also its stoichiometric ratios, like oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen ratios. So here's an example of something that they've done just for one PAH molecule, for pyrene only. Uh, they've they put together this uh, linear free energy relationship where log KDOC is a function of the absorptivity the extent to which the DOC absorbs light at 280 nanometers, which is a, you know, 280 nanometers is a pretty good indicator of aromaticity. 
Uh, and it also depends on the oxygen to carbon ratio. You can imagine if you have a lot of oxygen per carbon, that makes your compound relatively polar. Uh, and that's why the, the um, coefficient is negative here, because as o the OC ratio goes up, it gets more polar and becomes a worse sorbent, so KDOC goes down. So this is for only one chemical, uh, looking at absorption of this one chemical, pyrene, on a bunch of different natural organic matter, or dissolved organic matter samples. In the real world, we typically do not measure things like um, oxygen carbon ratios or absorptivity. So this is an interesting theoretical construct, but in the real world, not particularly useful. Um, we could think about the interactions of things like pH and ionic strength and temperature on the value of KDOC, but that's really, really tricky because first of all, just measuring KDOC is tough. Uh, measuring it as a function of ionic strength and temperature is even more difficult. And, you know, the reason that dissolved organic carbon is dissolved is because it has a lot of these polar functional groups, like carboxylic acid groups, that tend to be negatively charged at most normal pHs. Uh, as you add ions, like calcium, you can neutralize some of that negative charge. So when the DOC has lots of negative charge, those negative charges are all repelling each other and the DOC is sort of spread out. But if you add ionic strength in the form of sodium or calcium or whatever, you neutralize some of that charge and you allow the dissolved organic carbon to curl in on itself, which could very much affect its absorptive properties. Um, so what does that mean? We don't know. Uh, and of course, pH would have the same effect by protonating some of those functional groups. They would no longer be negatively charged and would change the conformation of the DOC. So this is really tricky. And generally speaking, we don't, we just ignore the effects of pH, ionic strength, and temperature on the KDOC because it's just too, too difficult to, to really quantify them. Now, if you're in uh, the open ocean, your ionic strength and your pH are fixed pretty much. Uh, and even if you're in an estuary like Raritan Bay, your uh, ionic strength is high. You know, in the open ocean, ionic strength is about 0.5 molar. In the Raritan Bay, it might be about 0.3 molar, but it's still pretty high, and that also fixes the pH. So this only becomes an issue if you're thinking about the behavior of your chemical in fresh surface waters, where the pH, the ionic strength is low, therefore there's not a lot of buffering capacity, and therefore the pH can change pretty dramatically. We do have linear free energy relationships that can allow us to use KOW to predict K for DOC. As is typical for linear free energy relationships, these work okay for individual classes of compounds. So in this upper figure, here's a line for arenes and for alkanes and for PAHs but they're not the same line. You have to have a separate line for each of these classes of chemicals. Again, this is log KDOC as a function of log KOW. Down here in the lower figure, this is one set of chemicals. So this is a set of PAHs, and it's seven different types of humic and fulvic acid. That's the seven lines you see here. And so for the same set of compounds, you get different linear free energy relationships depending on the the source of the DOC. Uh, and so that's not a happy, happy thing. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's tough. And you can see that the slopes of these seven different lines are pretty similar, but the intercepts are definitely pretty far off. So, yeah, it's, it's tough. Predicting KDOC is difficult. We've done a lot of work with P PCBs. Uh, this is some work that we did way back when I was still Lisa Totten. That's my when I was still married to my first husband. <laughs> Yay, divorce! Um, so yeah, we did a bunch of work at Raritan Bay where we were measuring PCBs and PAHs in the waters of Raritan Bay. Of course, you know we're sitting here at Rutgers. Rutgers is on the banks of the old Raritan. The Raritan River flows out into the Raritan Bay, which is part of the New York New Jersey Harbor. So this is nearby. And so we were out in Raritan Bay, and we were measuring PCBs in the dissolved and aqueous, excuse me, the dissolved and the particulate phases. Uh, but of course, what we were measuring as quote unquote dissolved wasn't maybe necessarily completely dissolved, right? So when we would go out and measure uh, the concentration in the aqueous phase and the concentration in the particle phase, we could calculate what we called an apparent KOC value. Don't know why that happens. 
I'm having problems with my mouse. Uh, parent KOC. Um, and that's the, the open circles here. So the open circles are the, the uh, KOC value calculated with no correction at all. And when you do that, you get a slope for the log KOC versus log KOW of about 0.7. We know from our previous lecture on Zorption that Karakov had predicted that the slope ought to be 1, and Mater and Pankow and lots of other people have predicted that the slope ought to be 1. So why isn't it 1? Well, you can measure the amount of dissolved organic carbon in your sample, and then you can make some educated guesses and say, okay, maybe my KDOC is equal to about 0.1 times KOC. Um, and based on that, you could recalculate KOC based on what you think is truly dissolved. You could sort of subtract out the fraction that you think is dis that, that is sticking to the DOC. Uh, and when you do that, you change the position. So that's where you get the black symbols here. And when your log KOW is on the low side, say around 5-ish, the difference between the dark circles and the open circles is almost not even visible, very, very small. But for things with a high log KOW, the difference is quite big. And so the, there's a much bigger correction factor for, for uh, data points over here and very little correction factor for data points over there, and that changes your slope. So when you make that correction, lo and behold, you get a slope pretty close to 1. So this is evidence that uh, the DOC is binding to or absorbing some of the PCBs. And this is important because one of the main removal processes for PCBs in the water column is to volatilize out into the air. So PCBs that are sticking to that dissolved organic carbon are not volatilizing. And so we need to get a good handle on that to be able to predict the fate of these chemicals. Uh, so here's another example. This is from the Delaware River. My student, Amy Rowe, she's my first PhD student. Yay, Amy! She's now a county extension agent um, for Rutgers. She went out and measured these blue samples, blue uh, symbols, excuse me, so that's the log of the apparent KOC value, plotted versus log KOW. And you can see this, this, so the black line is the one-to-one -one line, and you can see her data doesn't really fall on the one-to-one -one line. So what she did is she kind of did this experiment backwards, and she said, okay, let's assume that KDOC is equal to some correction factor M times KOW. Uh, and she said, okay, well, what does M have to be in order to get the slope here to be equal to 1? and she got an M value of 0.14. So that's a pretty good, um, pretty good corroboration of our, our guess here that the, the correction factor was about 0.1 or 0.2. So that's, that's reasonable. Now, uh, so just to point out how important this is, this is the diagram of the PCB sorbent processes and their transport and fate model for the Delaware River. Uh, this is the model that was used to calculate a total maximum daily load, right? So this total maximum daily load has a big impact on the businesses, the, the facilities that, that operate in the Delaware River. Um, nobody uses PCBs anymore because they've been banned for a long time, but they show up sort of inadvertently or unplanned in your effluents. And so almost everybody who discharges anything into the Delaware Bay has at least some PCBs in their effluent and have to do something about it. Uh, and so the TMDL is a calculation of how much PCBs they can continue to dump into the river. Uh, and they want, you know, the businesses on the river want the regulatory agency to get that number right. They don't want it to be too high. They don't want it to be too low, which means that they want it to be based on the best science available. And so to get the, the best fit of the model predictions to the actual data, they ha what they have to do is they have to assume that there's a dissolved phase, there's some of the PCBs that are bound to dissolved organic carbon, and then there's some that are bound to particulate carbon. And in this particular model, they divided the particulate into particulate detrital carbon, which is dead stuff, and biotic carbon, which is phytoplankton. And functionally speaking, the difference between the two is that phytoplankton settle more slowly, so this area is a little bit smaller, whereas detrital carbon settles faster because it's dead. Um, and also, detrital carbon can get resuspended, whereas phytoplankton, once they die, they stay dead. They might become, they might go over here and become detrital carbon, but they don't rise up again as biotic carbon. So anyway, the point is, you have to have your DOC-bound chemical in the model to make any sense, which means you need to know KDOC, and then, of course, you also have to know KOC, 
to get this part of the model to work out right. So this, the surface water, they, pr they divided the carbon into the detrital carbon and the living carbon. In the sediment, they just have dissolved, DOC bound, and bound as particles. And then in the deeper sediment, again, they have dissolved PCB, DOC bound, and absorbed to particulate carbon. So this is what we typically call a three-phase model, um, where you have the three important phases, dissolved, DOC, and particulate organic carbon. All right, so that's all we need to talk about in terms of absorption. And uh, next, if you want to go listen to your next you know, podcast or whatever, I'm going to do some example problems.